Luke 19, if you want to be turning there, we will eventually get there. Uh, Luke 19, we're going to uh, do uh, verses 11 through 27. But I want to start off with something that is the reality of all of us. And that is that we all want to be important. We all want to matter. We all want to be noticed. This is deep within us. In fact, God designed us that way. To be important and to, and to matter. From the very beginning, he told Adam and Eve, you will have dominion over the whole earth. Wow. To rule over all his creation. That's pretty weighty responsibility. And God made you and me to be a part of that. And so we want to make a difference. We all want to make a big difference. Now, if you've ever been around somebody famous or great, um, you might remember how it felt. Kind of excited. Um, kind of you're part of the honor, part of the greatness. If you're around some famous person or some great person, uh, there was an excitement. I experienced something like that this past Thursday. It was uh, honoring Judge Ricardo H. Hinojosa, 2014 uh, Border Texan of the Year. And I was amazed. I've never been to one of those uh, ceremonies and times of, of honoring someone like that. Wow, it was really, really impressive. And as I sat there and I listened and I looked around, it's like, wow, I mean, I'm around in very important people. And there was an uplifting of my soul as, as I looked around. And it's amazing. Those that honored him, uh, Judge Hinojosa, were fellow judges, uh, U.S. congressmen, uh, even former President Bush uh, came out on a video uh, honoring the judge. Like, wow, this is really, really impressive. And then the accolades of Dr. Inohosa or Judge Inohosa kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming. Like, wow. Um, speaker after speaker acknowledging the wonderful character traits and humility of this Judge Inohosa. I, I don't know Judge Inohosa, but I was like, my word, very, very impressive. I was lifted up, somehow part of that greatness, of that great gathering. And we all want to be a part of that. We all want to matter. Isn't that the case? <clears throat> Don't we want people to notice us? Especially when we do something good and honoring to God. It's like, look. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You see? The problem becomes when we're putting our hopes in the wrong place. In the wrong person. We have motives that are not of the Lord, and that becomes a problem. Um, the Bible is very clear, uh, just by way of introduction. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 6 says this, 1 Peter chapter 6 and verse 17. Second P uh, Timothy, 1 Peter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope in the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies with us all, all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves treasures of good foundation for the future. So that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. That which is life indeed. Where are you placing your hope? Where are you and I figuring that we're going to be important? Or are you just trying to survive? You know, what a way to live. If we're just barely trying to survive. Are you just trying to fit in? You know, that's a big problem, no? Do I fit in or not? Do the other ladies like me or not? Do the other guys respect me or not? We all have that question inside of us. Or maybe, maybe you just feel pressure to, to pretend that everything's okay. And that you're fine, thank you very much. But inside, you're dying. Inside, they're full of fear and loneliness. 
that shows where, where we're placing our hope. We may not understand it, but we need to be truthful. Maybe you're facing a future that you're scared of. You don't know what's going to happen. And you're scared, and it's hard to admit to that. Or maybe you know of someone who's full of fear and so lonely and trapped. How do you encourage them? Where is God in all this anyway? Where is God in all this? <laughs> From the very beginning, God has always been involved in fallen humanity, right? From Adam and Eve, uh, God came searching, Adam, where are you? God didn't need information. God needed Adam to be honest about where he was. And what did Adam do? He passed the buck, right? Well, the woman that you gave me. <laughs> and on and on and on. We pass on the guilt or shame or whatever to somebody else. But inside, Adam was afraid and lost. And there was a brokenness between Adam and Eve. But God was very involved and he provided uh, skins for them to cover themselves, cover their shame. And throughout history, God has been over and over and over sending prophets. And he said, Abraham and Moses and all the prophets. And he's constantly be trying to save humanity. But humanity turns away from the Lord. And that's been the ongoing reality. And then came Jesus Christ. And then came the Lord Jesus, the, 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 it, the climax of all history, so to speak. The revelation of God himself. And he spoke truth and he spoke it with love. And all the character, the wonderful character of God. And they still rejected him. But God has always been involved in saving humanity. And so before I go on, I must ask, have you trusted in Christ? Because that's God's ultimate work of salvation for us. That Jesus Christ came, died for our sins, rose again from the dead. And the Bible tells us that if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved, that is, delivered from God's judgment. Delivered from God's settled, righteous wrath against sin. The wrath of God. It's righteous. It is eternal. And Jesus Christ's death and resurrection saves us from that judgment. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the word of God, not of this preacher. The word of God. So we beg you, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now in Luke... Uh, Jesus Christ has been demonstrating over and over and over and over that he is the promised Messiah, the one that God promised to Adam and Eve, to Abraham, through Moses, through the prophets. He's the one. He's the one. And specifically, Jesus has been demonstrating over and over that he is son of man. Now, we cover that, uh, so we just pass by it. But the Son of Man, Jesus Christ revealed to be, himself to be the Son of Man as shown by the prophet Daniel. So if you have your Bibles real quickly, turn to Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Because we need to get a clear picture. Who is this Son of Man? The Son of Man came to, not to serve, but to, uh, not to be, not to be served, but to serve others. But this Son of Man... Daniel chapter 7, and starting in verse 13, here Daniel has received the vision of the future, and he sees the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? God the Father, right? And there's this vision that's shown, and now look at what Daniel 7 verse 13 says. I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man, there it is, one like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people, nations, and, and of men, and every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion 
which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This is the Son of Man, you see. He's the one that receives the deed to the whole universe, so to speak. You see, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus Christ himself refers to himself as the Son of Man. And so he came, and the Gospel of Luke demonstrates over and over and over that this is the Son of Man, referred to in Luke chapter 7. And now we get to Luke chapter 19, and uh, Jesus is getting get close to Jerusalem. And since he had done all those works and all these wonderful miracles and so forth, everybody expecting, oh, the kingdom is coming. He's here. And Jesus had to correct some, some expectations, some assumptions that they were making. And so let me read the passage, uh, Luke 19, starting in verse 11. And once again, this, brothers and sisters, this is for all of us. It's very, very important for all of us. So we pick it up. Luke 19 and verse 11. And, th and while they were listening to these things, and that's what Jesus had been, spoke, uh, been speaking in the pa previous passage, when he was talking, about, uh, talking to Zach uh, Zac Zacchaeus, and they had been, you know, I'll go over a little bit over that. And Jesus says, well, he, said he knew something was up. And while he was speaking these things, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas and said to them, and by the way, a mina, mina is a uh, 100 denarii and one denarii is a day's work. So he basically gave him three months of salary, so to speak. That's, that's the meaning there. He gave him about three months worth of salary to do business, he says now. Uh, let me read verse 13 again. He called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minutes and said to them, do business with until I come back. Because, but, listen to this, very key, but his citizens hated him. And sent a delegation after him, saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And it came about that when he returned, he received the, his, uh, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that the slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him in order to, that he might know what business they had done. And the first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing, be in authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, your mena, master, has made five menas. And he said to him, also, you are to be over five cities. And another came, saying, master, behold your mena which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up where you did not lay down, and reap where you did not sow. He said to him, by your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Literally the word there is evil, wicked slave. Did you know that I'm an exacting man, taking up where I did not lay down? And reaping where I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have received, collected it with interest. And he said to the bystanders, take up the money away from him. And give it to the one that has ten minutes. And they said to him, Master, he has ten already. I tell you, now Jesus is speaking the first person. The moral of the story, so to speak. I tell you. That to everyone who has, shall be given. But to one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. 
Jesus came, died, rose again from the dead. He gave instructions, and then we, he went on to be with the Father. He's coming back. He's coming back. The one who got killed, tortured, and killed, rose again from the dead. He's coming, went to the Father, and he's coming back to judge. He is alive and well, and he's coming back. Believers are to be productive. Believers are to be productive as they wait for King Jesus' return. Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have, you are to be productive for the kingdom of God. Now, there were some false expectations. And so Jesus had to first clarify those false expectations. And you and I can have false expectations, even though we are believers. These people were following the Lord Jesus Christ. They were excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. But they had some false expectations. Verses 11 through 14, I think that's what Jesus is doing. He is correcting some faulty expectations. 15 through 25, it's reward time. When he returns, it will be reward time. And then finally, 26 and 27, the moral of the story. And these are from Jesus' words, not mine. Okay. So, we begin. What are these faulty expectations? Uh, believers are to be fruitful, to be productive for the kingdom of God. Note that this passage is about the kingdom of God. It's not so much about money per se, material goods. It's about the kingdom of God, the spiritual realities. And that right there uh, tells us so much because we are so used to the physical. We think if I am materially successful, if I am socially successful, if I am educationally successful, that's where it's at. No, it's about the kingdom of God. Because that's what they wanted right away. They were thinking the kingdom of God is going to come immediately. Supposedly when Jesus entered Jerusalem. The capital. The spiritual capital. The uh, political capital. Everything there in Jerusalem. And they were near Jerusalem. That's what the text says, right? And so we need to be careful that we don't fall into that temptation. Thinking that the physical things, the physical success is where it's at. No, um, that's the first thing. The other thing it says there that as he was talking about these things, what things? The one he had talked with Zac Zacchaeus about. Zacchaeus was a very rich man. You see? And uh, thinking that Jesus was having success even with the rich people. Ah, oh, you see? Success with the rich people. The kingdom is coming. No. No. So he gives them this parable to correct that, the kingdom is not immediate, but you must, be, you must be productive. You must be working for the kingdom of God. So here we go. Um, we talked already about, he called his slaves. Did you note that? There are about three different characters here. You've got the owner, who is Jesus himself, right? He puts himself in the parable, and he's the owner the nobleman, he is the king, and then you have the slaves, and then you have the citizens, right? And it's very important to get those three. He, he calls ten of his slaves. A slave, someone who just merely is uh, responsible to someone else, under somebody else's ownership. And then you have the citizens. Now, he gives them ten minutes, right? Uh, one minute each. And then he says, do business with them. And then Jesus says, but the citizens hated him. Okay, now, I'll get this picture right. He gives them three months worth of salary to do business. Do business with who? People that hate the king. How successful is that going to be? How hard is that going to be? That's the point Jesus wants to communicate to his disciples. Listen, I'm leaving you. It's going to be tough. Because I'm telling you to do business people, with people that hate me. 
You see, sometimes we think in the Christian life, ooh, success, ooh, the Spirit of God, ooh, it's going to be great, pumped up. And all of a sudden we forget that it can be very difficult. His citizens hated him. And who are the citizens? Well, it says there in verse 14, and his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, now who, listen, listen, who can afford a delegation? Can the slaves afford delegation? No. People that send del their delegates or he's like an ambassador or even a group of representatives. These people had money. Uh, I'm too important to go. Uh, let's get an ambassador to go for us, and we'll instruct him or what our message is. Wow. That's who, was sent, who, that's who was hating Jesus, the king. So here we have slaves and very wealthy people, and they're to do business together. The, the, the disciples, the, the slaves are to do business with them. That's our world, by the way. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You want to follow Christ? Listen, it's going to be tough to live the Christian life. Even with the Spirit of God with us, we're going to encounter resistance, even hatred. But sometimes in the church, we don't want to say that. Because people might get discouraged. Jesus Christ is our leader, and he was absolutely straight up. Here's the deal. You see, And so now, when he's calling for faithfulness, now this call for faithfulness is very weighty, you see. It's not a quick, easy thing to live this Christian life. And so there we have it. Here's the situation. Are you going to follow Christ or not? Are you going to be productive or not in this hostile world? King Jesus is telling you and me, I want you to be productive for my kingdom. It's going to be tough. But let me tell you, there is a day of reckoning. I am coming back. And there will be a time of rewards. Or loss. Or judgment. And so now we get to the reward time. Right? Verses 15 uh, through 25. So he returns. And uh, to, after receiving his kingdom, in order, and he ordered the slave to be brought to him to give an account, basically. Uh, what have you been doing? There's no way around that, brothers and sisters. There's no way around it. We will face Jesus. The first one came, and he said, hey, this one minute, it made, it made uh, 10. A uh, thousand percent? Oh, wow. In the midst of a hostile world. Wow, that, that brother or sister, uh, they were busy. <laughs> they were willing to sacrifice and be savvy. Uh, uh, be as innocent as does, but as shrewd as serpents, right? Uh, it's not easy. But this one, a thousand percent increase. And now what does the king say, the owner say? Uh, you were faithful in something that was very little, right? That's what he says. Very little. Listen, brothers and sisters, to be faithful in the little things of life. We have the idea, I'm going to be a Steve Jobs. I'm going to be Justin Bieber. I'm going to be, all of a sudden, I'm going to jump to fame and jump to all these great things. No, no. It's about being faithful with the little things. Let God do the increasing. You be faithful. You be faithful. You be faithful. Because you've been faithful in very little, now look what he does. He says, um, I, and the word there, and the last part of verse 17, is authority. Power. Now he's just not giving him money. He's giving him power. Power. And he gave him power over what? Ten cities. I mean, the reward is so out of proportion. It's craziness. And what does that show? You know what it shows? That, that the rewards really is not about so much 
about paying you back. It's the generosity of God. It is God's intentions so that, that we would be glorious, that we would have authority, that we would have all this power and impact and importance. That's what God intends for us. He has good intentions for us. You see? The reward is so out of proportion. I mean, from, t you know, three months worth. Okay, I got you back, uh, what, two years worth of money. Jesus says, have authority over ten cities. Woo -hoo -hoo. But you see, that's God's good intentions. And then the next one shows up. Right? Hey, you're made, you made five. Five hundred percent. Five cities. Again, way out of proportion. The reward is way out of proportion. That's the point. God's good intentions. He wants us to be important. He made us to be important to matter. You see? We only need to be involved in the kingdom of God, not self. And then comes the worthless, wicked slave. And what we find out is that, uh, really, he's full of excuses. He's full of excuses. And that, that's really the, what, what, what shows up. Right? He comes along. And he says, hey, here's your minna. I didn't steal from you. Here it is. <laughs> I was afraid of you. I hid it. I didn't use it. I didn't steal. But I wasn't productive. Because I was afraid of you. Afraid of you. And he says... Um, I know it to be you, you to be an exacting man. And you take up where you did not lay down. In other words, even where you did not invest, you're going to take. Almost saying you're kind of criminal. And you're going to reap where you did not sow. You're kind of unfair. Hmm. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? So the king says, you know what? By your very words, by your very words, you're going to be judged. If you knew I was this kind of man, wouldn't you have at least put in the bank so I can get interest? No, no, no. You're making excuses. You're lying. The fact of the matter is, you were a slave. I gave to you opportunity. Number one. Number two, I gave you the same as others. Number three, you had already heard what I did to the others when they were productive. But you're calling me an exacting man, uncaring, almost criminal. You see, brothers and sisters, the beginning of us not being involved in the kingdom of God is having erroneous theology. Attributing to God characteristics that are not His. It's of our own fear, our own presuppositions, our own vision of who God is. Instead of going to the scriptures and finding out who is God. No, we have our own experiences that we go by. And we think that God is this uncaring, insensitive despot ruling over us and doesn't really care for us. And when we have that theology, well, of course, who is going to want to be involved in that kingdom? <laughs> you be mean like that to me. But you see, that's erroneous theology. And then we can come up with all, try, try, try to come up with all kinds of excuses when we get face to face with him and when we get face to face with him no loopholes no excuses we won't be able to con ourselves through this whole mess nah by your own words you're going to be judged wow when you and I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ what are we going to say about the way we did our life. I'm excited for you guys that are here from Waco. Oh, you want to serve God. You, you want to share the gospel. You want to share the gospel of the one who died for me. 
And therefore, you encourage me tremendously because you love my Savior and you want to share him. Don't be ashamed. Be ready for opposition, perhaps even persecution. But he's worthy. He is worthy now and for all eternity. Because he's the one that can judge. In fact, what did he do? He told the bystanders, hey, take the manna and give it to the one that has 10. But, 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 but he already has 10. The one who has, more will be given. The one who doesn't have, even what he does have will be taken away. Be productive for the kingdom of God. Be productive for the kingdom of God. He gives the moral of the story, right? Verse 26, I tell you, to everyone who has shall more be given. But to the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Rewards. I'll say more about that. But then he comes to the last verse, right? And what does the last verse say? These enemies of mine. Who are the enemies? The one who did not want to reign, uh, me to reign over them, right? Those are the ones from verse 14. Uh, these are the wicked. These are the ones that refused me as king. Come, slay them in front of me. You know, that picture of Jesus is a little bit different than him hanging on the cross. When he is judged and says, though, you know, here's the point. There's no way around God. There is no way around God. You know, we, have in a, we live in a culture where it says, I don't like that person. I'm not going to listen to them. <laughs> I don't like my parents. I'm going to sue them. It's happening. I don't like my coach. <clears throat> the... You know, I'm going to boycott him. That guy over there, he's so arrogant. Look at him. <laughs> that girl, she looks like she's hot stuff. I'm never going to talk to her. When we come to Jesus Christ, we will not be able to get around him. No way around dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ. No way around. You see... He is owner of all that is. He is owner and Lord over all humanity. He owns us. Whether we like it or not. Whether we submit to him or not. We're going to give an account to him. And it will be heaven or hell. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no way around him. And then if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, serve him. Because this whole area of reward. We will receive from the Lord. Uh, Judge Hinojosa, 2014 Border Texan of the Year, received honor after honor after honor. One word from Jesus. If he says even a hint that I served him a little bit is worth more than all the accolades that Judge Hinojosa received. Because she, this is God Almighty. God Almighty. That's what we will receive when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you? Will you receive Will you give to the Lord Jesus Christ? Um, listen, it's only wise. This passage, really, this parable, it's about wisdom. It's about wisdom. What is truly valuable? Where are you going to get your importance? It needs to be through serving the Lord Jesus Christ. But then, here's another application. Don't be surprised by opposition. Don't be surprised by tribulations. Don't be surprised. Persecutions. 
The Christian life is not about being comfortable. The Christian life is not about being happy, happy all the time. It's about serving in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of hard times, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be real about life. Expect that it's going to be hard. There's many places that Jesus put, pointed that out. In this life you will have tribulations. But be of good courage. I have overcome the world. But nevertheless, you're going to have tribulations. John 17. They're going to hate you. But just remember, when they hate you, they first hated me. I'm with you, even to the end of the age. You see, brothers and sisters, as Christians, we need to be realistic. We need to be honest because when, we do not, when we're not honest and we tell uh, fellow believers everything's going to be great, God's going to bless you, going to bless you, and then hard times come, you're like, well, what kind of God is that? People can't get angry with the Lord because they were never, never spoken the truth. The, the, the Christian life can be rough. Jesus was crucified. The apostle Paul was stoned and left for dead. The apostle all suffered persecution. The apostle John, the last one, was, you know, thrown to Patmos, exiled by himself. Jesus says uh, right there in this parable, those that you're going to try and do business with, those of you that you're going you're to try to live the Christian life and witness to, they're going to hate me. Now, by the Spirit of God, I'm going to change some of them. But expect it. Then finally, you need to make a decision, a very clear decision. Some of you, I would suspect hopefully all of you from Waco have made that decision that you are going to serve the Lord. And if you haven't, and for those of us that are not from Waco, we need to make a very conscious, intentional decision to be involved in the kingdom of God. The day is coming when no one will be able to work. Jesus put it this way, the night is coming when no man works, John 9. And there's something about um, having lost the opportunity to serve the Lord. I try to use this illustration like when people are in war, in battle, and, you know, and, and you know, they really are fighting, and they're scared, they hold back, and they hide, and they hide, and they hide, and then the war is over, and they're handing out the rewards, the medals, and so forth. It's like, and me? And me? Well, I hid. I didn't do anything. Okay, okay, let me go back to battle. Now I'll do something great for God. Come on, let me, let's go back to battle. No, it's over. War's over. Oh, come on, I should have done something great. Yeah, but it's too late. The same thing with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to serve him now. The day is coming when it'll be all over. It'll be all over. So make a very clear, conscious decision. That you're going to serve the Lord. Not just in general things. Your neighborhood. The parks. Your family. Your friends. Whoever you come in contact with. That you're going to serve the kingdom of God. And I want you to note. Who you're serving. The Lord Jesus Christ. You know. He was about to be made king. And he said no. You know anybody who wants to be, be promoted to being president, whatever, and then they say no because the time is not? Are you kidding me? Jesus did. You know why? Because he first had to suffer. Because he first had to go to the cross. Because if he didn't go to the cross, you and I would go to hell. And so he didn't take the position of being king at that time. He could have sp uh, skipped all the suffering. He could have skipped the cross. No. He loved you and me. Way too much. For him to skip that. To skip the cross. No. He's worthy. Jesus Christ is worthy. To be served now. And for eternity. Will you make that decision to serve him? Will you? It's going to get tough at times. It's going to get tough. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you. 
Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. Please, Father, may your spirit take over our minds, our hearts. And as we make decisions, Father, that you would give us the grace to follow through. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all your goodness and giving us this opportunity to serve you, to learn about you and serve you. Father, we pray for anyone who may be here and not know the Lord Jesus, that this morning, Lord, would be the greatest morning for them, that they would believe, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved now and forever, in whose name we pray, amen.